for, for his heart to be our mission in life. And I believe that that begins at home. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 6, talking about caring for people and loving one another and seeing after people, it says, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Now, we don't want to neglect the world. We don't, we don't want to do anything here to the, to the neglect of uh, reaching out to a lost world, but we don't want to neglect the household of faith either. People that are in the church, we need to pray for one another and care about one another. Our, our goal is to be a, a church family that cares, a caring church family. And that's going to be the title of the message today, a caring church family. Our, our goal is to help every believer here to become a minister so that as a church family, we are fishing with nets that do not have holes in them. Now, I was wondering something yesterday, and I'm going to see if I can find this out. Uh, maybe some of y'all know, but let's, let's don't have a discussion here right now. But I got to thinking about when did fishing with a hook come in? When did uh, fishing with trot lines become a become a thing? When when did it when did fishing with a with a cane pole and then a rod and reel? When did all of that start? When did when did shocking fish? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know we can catch a lot of fish. Uh, I forgot, brother Robert's here to change that. <laughs> You know, in the Bible, as far as I can remember, it always talks about using a net. And, and using a net, uh, you catch a lot of fish, but if your net is in disrepair, your net has problems, you're not going to do it. You're wasting a lot of time. You might catch one or two, you know, get caught in the net somehow, but if your net is not mended, then you're going to lose a lot of fish. Can we be honest and admit that as a church family, our net needs mending. We need to, we need to patch up some holes. And, and that's what I'm trying to do is, is preach some messages that will, that will help us to catch a vision of we ourselves becoming, becoming the, the strands, the, the, the threads, the material of the net. Every time a fisherman went fishing with his nets, then he would come home and he would have to spend time repairing them. And that's what we have to do on Sundays is spend time repairing the net, encouraging one another, loving on one another, uh, sharing in Sunday school, learning about discipleship, learning how to more adequately serve God. And on Sunday morning, we, we gather together and we worship the Lord. We spend time together lifting up our voices to the Lord and worshiping Him. Then the preacher gets up and preaches a message, hopefully inspired and anointed by God. Uh, a message that helps us, teaches us, equips us, encourages us in some way so that we ourselves can be lifted up. So that we can in turn lift up others and minister to them. Every believer must come to a point where they realize that I am called to be a minister in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm not doing something for God's kingdom, I'm not doing what God has called me to do. God called you. God has put you in this church to be more than just someone who shows up and, and, and feeds from the, from, the, from the feed that God has for you. But God wants to feed you, but then He has work for you to do in His kingdom. And your response may be, well, I can't do much. There's nothing that I can do. I want to tell you, everybody, we can find something between you and me and God. We can help you find something if it's nothing but handing people a card and inviting them to church. I can imagine that just about anybody can walk up to someone in the IGA and hand them a card. You can have them a card, turn beet red, feel your... Feel your uh, Life just go out of you, but you've handed them a card. You walk away, hopefully you don't fall down, and, and you've done something for the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Hopefully everybody here 
can come to church on Sunday morning. Maybe you can pick out two or three people, four or five people and say, if they're not there today, I'm going to check on them. I'm going to see where they are. Maybe everybody in some way or somehow can become a minister. And maybe together we call ourselves a caring church family. Maybe we can present ourselves as workmen that need to not be ashamed, rightly dividing, studying the word of truth. And then maybe we can be not only hearers of the word, but doers also. Maybe we can be what we call ourselves. Amen. Amen. You got to throw the preacher a bone every now and then. You want to keep on hurting. A caring church family is what I want to talk about today. I want to read from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy. This is the Apostle Paul writing. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let's pray. Our Father, in Jesus' name, we bow our hearts. And we humbly pray and ask for your anointing upon the preaching and upon the hearing of your word. God, I pray that you would instill in our hearts your calling to become ministers for the kingdom. To become a caring church family. Help us in this, we pray, and we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now before I begin, Miss Lee, I want to ask you, would you be prepared to play an, uh, uh, an invitation if you want to thank you? A caring church family. Paul says, if there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Now, I've read from that scripture. You're welcome to turn to John chapter 15 if you want to, or it's going to be on the screen. I'm going to, I read uh, Ephesians chapter 2, I'm going to preach from John chapter 15, and then we're going to come back and close from Ephesians chapter 2 again. How is that? A church, a caring church family, what does that look like? Is that a church family where you show up and you feel cared for? Is that what we're talking about? Yes, that's what we're talking about. A caring church family. Is that where you show up and you care for others? Yes, that's what we're talking about. What does a caring church family look like? Well, let me tell you what it does for you, first of all. Loving others produces joy yeah. in your life. Love and others produces joy. John chapter 15 and verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. He's talking about in the context right here of loving other people. Doing the work of God and loving other people. When you care about others, it takes your mind off of your own problems. That's right. How many of you have problems? Don't raise your hand. You got problems? When we get involved in the lives of others, it helps us to realize that other people have real problems also. It does. I wonder sometimes if we really ever think about the problems that everybody, yeah, I know they've got problems, but theirs are not nearly as bad as mine. <laughs> A lot of people feel that way. The best way to get rid of our problems, I believe, is to show genuine concern for others and get involved in helping them. Loving other people produces joy. I know that we live in hard times. And I know that, that people face difficulties. I know that we have problems of our own. But you know what? God has called us to minister to other people in spite of our own problems. Whenever we... Whenever we become closed in and focus on the things that are touching our own lives, that, that's when we begin to have problems. That's when it, it, it feels like the whole world is closing in. Now, I'm, I'm 49 years old. How many of y'all say that's, that's kind of old? 
That means that we have a choice to either obey or not to obey. Look at your spouse, not right now. Look at the person you're married to. You can choose to love that person or you can choose not to. What did Jesus say? He was asked one day, what is the greatest commandment? And he said the greatest commandment is this, to love God. That's the greatest commandment. With everything you have in you, love God. And everybody was satisfied and said, okay, that's a good answer. Let's go home. And he said, oh, 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 wait a minute. The second greatest commandment, while we're here, is to love people. <laughs> love your neighbor. Love people. Who's your closest neighbor? How about the person that sleeps right next to you every night, huh? You got to start by loving folks in your own house. What about your children? What about your grandchildren? What about your neighbor that you can't stand? His, his garbage. I used to live in a neighborhood before I moved here. I got, Timbo's not here this morning, but I got a great neighbor. I love my neighbor. But we lived in a neighborhood where we had them on either side of us. I couldn't sit on the porch swinging and whisper sweet nothings in my wife's ear without my neighbor here. I tell you, <laughs> I love not living in a, in, right up next to folks. That just ain't me, you know. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't live in apartments. You know? <laughs> Pam says I talk too loud. Anyways, I, I love apartments. <laughs> so, anyways, my neighbor's garbage used to grow, blow over in my yard. I, I never said anything to him. Why don't you just put your garbage in a can and put a lid on, like everybody else does? But their garbage was always in my yard. And I'd be out there picking up their garbage, put it in a bag, and I'd just be praying for them. God bless them. God bless them. <laughs> Before I have to tell them what I think. I lived there for four years. I never said a word. The day we left, their garbage was still blown over in my yard. That's okay, though, because when we left, we couldn't find our outside cat, and I just left them for the neighbor. <laughs> He's not saying, listen guys, the second, the first one is a commandment, you gotta love God. The second one is a suggestion. If you feel like it, how about loving people? No. No, he says, this is my commandment. That you love one another. That you love people. That you love people. It's not a, if you feel like it. People say, people get married and then they say, well, we were in love, but we fell out of love. That's not the truth. That's right. Love is not something you fall in. It's not doo-doo, hello. <laughs> and it's not something that you fall out of. <laughs> well, that's the way people act sometimes. Well, I stand in love. I got it on my shirt. <laughs> What you're talking about there is, is those little, those little, uh, that little chill going up and down your spine and your, your hands get all sweaty and all that. That's called infatuation. Huh? That, that's called a lot of things, but it ain't love. I'm telling you, we need to understand what love is. Uh, you, you thought I said something funny just then. I'm going to gross you out now. But love is when you don't mind holding your spouse's head while they throw it up in the toilet. That's love. Amen. Love is after you have been married for a number of years and you look at her and you say, you sweet thing, I love you more today than the day I married you. That's love. Love is when you go through tribulation and trials together and instead of turning on each other and shooting and killing one another, love is sticking together, hanging on to each other, growing closer to God and growing closer to each other. That is love. And it works in, in homes, and it works in neighborhoods, and it works in churches. Yes, it does. Tell you something else, love is not. Love is not a feeling. Love is not a noun. A noun is something, a word is a noun, a person, a place, or a thing. That's not what love is. Love is something that you do. It is something that you do. And Jesus is saying, I command you. I command you, I'm not suggesting to you, I'm commanding you to love people. Love one another. There have been times in my life, and I know there have been times in your life that you didn't feel like loving somebody. But friend, that's when, that's when real love comes in. When you put your arms around somebody that has done you wrong and you tell them I forgive you, 
when you put your arms around somebody and tell them, I love you. And love isn't all the time growing up past faults and mistakes in their face and saying, yeah, but you did this and you did that. That's not love. That's bickering and arguing and fighting, but it's not love. Jesus said, I command you to love one another. Number one, loving others produces joy. Secondly, love is a choice. You get to choose whether you want to love somebody or not. Some of us need to improve our choices that we're making. Some of us need to work on our choosing because we are choosing to do other things instead of loving people. We're not obeying God. It's a commandment from the Lord Jesus Christ Himself to love people. Number three, sacrificial love is the greatest. John 15 and 13, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Sacrificial love. It's one thing to say you love people, but when it costs you something, when it costs you your life, some of you here are willing to step in front of a speeding bullet for others. Some of you are willing to lay down your life for your loved ones. But are you willing to hold your tongue? Are you willing to be patient? Are you willing to be kind? Are you willing to be gentle? Oh, it's one thing. I'll stand up for my family. I'll protect my family. I'll do this and I'll do that. But how do you treat them when you get them home and there's no one else around? How do you behave towards your neighbors when there's no one else around? How do you behave when someone you feel like has mistreated you, has done wrong to you? How do you act then? What do you do? Sacrificial love is the greatest. You want to love people? God tells us to love people. We need to love them sacrificially. A caring church family. What does it look like? Let's look at an effective church family for just a minute. An effective church family. Philippians chapter 1. We read earlier from Philippians chapter 2. This is at the end of chapter 1. That you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. What does a, what is a church, uh, an effective church family look like? First of all, it's going to be united. One mind, one spirit, striving together. God wants us to have unity. Furthermore, He wants us to have harmony. How many of you know what harmony is? Do you know that there's a difference between unity and harmony? Former superintendent of the Alabama district, uh, Brother T.H. Spence, said it this way. He said, you can take two cats and you can tie their tails together and you can throw them over a clothesline. He said, when you do that, you have unity. But you do not have harmony. <laughs> harmony is when you sound good together. Harmony, harmony is not playing the same note. Harmony is different notes. About to extend my piano. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> harmony is taking what I have to offer and making it sound good with what you have to offer. Harmony is loving each other. We have different opinions. We may have different ideas. We might think differently about how the church ought to do this or that or whatever. But harmony is not causing a stink. Harmony is saying, okay, I'm going to be part of that church. An effective church family is striving together for what? For my own interests? To make the church look like I think it ought to look? To make the church do what I think it ought to do? No. It is striving together for one thing. For the faith of the gospel. We are in the church business to spread the gospel. To tell the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means we got to get along and be harmonious about it. Amen. Amen. Just preaching the word. Get mad and get mad at Jesus. An effective church family. And secondly, I don't think I put this one up there, but Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 10, or verses 9 and 10. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he, will, for he has no one to help him up. Two are better than one. It's better. 
when people work together. I get, I get um, references every now and then. For some reason, people think that the preacher at Glad Tidings Assembly of God, and I was saying that putting him on my resume, putting him on my, uh, as, as a reference. And I'm glad for you to do that if I know you. I've had people do it that I didn't know. But <laughs> and people call and say, oh, so-and-so put you down as a reference. And I say, well, I don't know. I'm not going to tell them that I know you if I don't know you. And I need to know more than your name, too, because if they call me and they say, oh, so-and-so put you down as a reference, I say, yeah, I know their name. I know what they look like. That's all I know. I'm not going to lie for you. To God be the glory. I'm not going to tell them. Good old boy. Well, I know you probably are, but if I don't know it, I ain't going to tell them. But I have to fill out things sometimes for people. And you know what one of the questions they almost invariably ask is, how does this person get along with others? Do they work well with others? Hmm. Ask yourself that. Do you work well with others? I don't really work by myself. I've heard people say that. Well, I don't know what you believe, but the Bible says that two are better than one, better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse nine, verse ten. For if they fall, if they make a mistake, or if they're about to make a mistake, or if something happens on the job, one will lift up his command companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. That's right. Two are better. It's better to work with people. Yeah, but people don't do it the way I think they ought to do it. Well, join the club. <laughs> you don't do it as good as other people think you ought to do it either. And you don't do it as good as you think you do. But you do it the way you like it. And that's what, that's what you're saying. But hey, can't we all get along and work together for the glory of God? An effective church works together. An effective church has unity and harmony. An effective church is loving each other. An effective church family. Effective in what? In fact, effective in striving together for the faith of the gospel. I'm coming to an end here. This is where you come, please. What can I do? A church family, a caring church family, let's develop genuine interest in others, not just ourselves. Look, I know, I know that there are people here today. I don't mean to make light up. I don't mean to belittle it. I know there are people here today that are facing circumstances that that just really may be devastating. And I know that preacher well. It's, it's always that way. In our church family, there is always going to be at least one, probably more than one, that's facing facing a situation that, that just seems like the end of the world. And I don't mean to make light of that. But I want to tell you that in the midst of that, we need to be interested in other people. We need to, to develop a genuine interest. How do I do that, preacher? Well, lift up your eyes. When your eyes are filled with tears and you're hurting, wipe the tears from your eyes and say, God, open my eyes and open my heart. From the midst of my pain, help me to see what other people are feeling right now. Maybe in helping someone else, you will help me. Quoting again, and I didn't put the reference up there, but this is from Philippians chapter chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 4. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests. Paul's not saying you don't look out for your own interests. You've got to take care of yourself. You've got to watch out for yourself. You've got to watch out for the things that are important to you, your property, your family, all of that stuff, your job. But he says not only to look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. His heart is our mission. What is important to the heart of God must be important to us. And at all church, if we can, if we can somehow, some way, find a way to come together in love and in unity and harmony, saying to ourselves, you know what, there are going to be times that my needs aren't met by the church, but I'm going to be about the business of you and people. Say to ourselves, it's not always going to happen the way that I think it ought to happen, but God help me. I believe that God's heart is to use glad tidings, the assembly of God, on His great mission of loving God, of loving people, Amen. and serving people. Show them what that we love. Amen. Amen. It begins, though, when you begin your own relationship with Jesus Christ.
I want to ask you this morning with your head bowed for just a moment. Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Have you come to the point in your life where you've asked yourself the most vital question of all? Where am I going to spend eternity? Where am I going to be after I die? Some people say, well, we're not going to be anywhere. After we die, we're just going to cease to exist. I will tell you, that's the greatest faith of any kind of faith that there is. Everyone here has faith because everyone here has some belief about what happens after life. And that's what faith is, is believing something even though you cannot prove it. If you believe that you're not going to be anywhere and that you're not going to be alive and you're not going to do anything, then you have faith in that. You have faith in that. And I admire your faith. I don't want to be you. But I think that's great faith. I'll tell you the kind of faith I wish you had. That's the kind of faith that says, okay, maybe there is something after this life. And I'm going to trust my life to Jesus. You see, if you have faith that there's nothing, you're going to find out one day that there was something after this. Every person here is going to be a one. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, what you've done, no matter how bad you think you've been in your life, God wants you to spend eternity in heaven. Now, I want everybody to stand. And while you're standing up, if you want to spend eternity in heaven, and if you have not made plans to do so thus far,